tonight. Justin Trudeau thinks the Liberal Party is God's gift to Canada, and anyone else should be deleted. I'll show you just how arrogant he is. It's January 4th, and you're watching The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon consumer I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government for why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. I want to tell you about something that happened over the Christmas break that's still happening now that's a sign of things to come. The Liberal government has written to 33 public servants and demanded that they resign. Now, they haven't done anything wrong. They were just appointed by the Conservatives late, and their term extends well into the future. The Liberals don't like that. They want to appoint Liberals instead. Let me give you an example of one of the people they targeted, Deepak Chopra the CEO of Canada Post. No, he's not the spiritual guru by that same name. He's an expert in mail. Seriously, before he was hired by Canada Post, he was the chief executive at Pitney Bowes Asia Pacific and Pitney Bowes Canada and Latin America. Those are huge mailing companies. An analogy would be if Canada Post hired the CEO of Federal Express or something. Anyways, the guy was part of a worldwide recruitment drive. He was competing against other postal executives. The whole recruitment process was handled by the Privy Council office, that's the senior nonpartisan bureaucrats in Ottawa, not the politicians. My point is, Deepak Chopra is not some partisan hack. He's not some golfing buddy of Stephen Harper who was given the job as a perk like the Liberals used to do. I mean, remember when that Liberal cabinet minister, David Dingwall, lost an election, and so Jean Chrétien gave him the plum job of being the CEO of the Royal Canadian Mint? Of course, he had no special knowledge or talent running a mint, but he was a buddy of Chrétien's. And when he was turfed over questionable expenses, here's what he said. You're trying to say that entitlements, uh, I'm not entitled to my entitlements. No, I am entitled you. to my entitlements. Yeah, so Deepak Chopra is pretty much the opposite of how the Liberals used to run things. I'm not saying Chopra is perfect. I'm not saying Harper made no political appointments or that all of Harper's appointees are great. I'm just pointing out that the Liberals are trying to purge anything that has the mark of Stephen Harper on it, even solid nonpartisan technocrats like Deepak Chopra. And what are they trying to do, make room for David Dingwall again? The reason I mention all this is because it's part of a psychology that Liberals have rolled out in the two and a half months since they were elected, that nothing that happened under Stephen Harper is legitimate that that wasn't even the real Canada. I mean, it's even in their slogans. Canada is back, for example. Well, actually, Canada was always here. It's fine for liberals to say the liberals are back, but they're doing that liberal thing where they blur the two as if the Liberal Party is Canada and Canada is the Liberal Party. They're the entitled ones, the deserving ones, and anyone else is just an aberration. Think about the hubris there. Canada is back, as if the past nine years were false not the real Canada, as if there was an illegal usurper on the throne. It's like that old Roman concept of damnatio memoriae. That's Latin for may their memory be damned. That's what Roman emperors would do to folks they just assassinated or to traitors. Any law that that traitor would have ever passed would immediately be nullified. Their property seized. Any statues made of them would be destroyed. They would be blotted out of even paintings and mosaics. That's to be, basically to unperson them. That's what George Orwell called them in his book, 1984. Here's how Joseph Stalin did it. He just airbrushed out an unperson from official photos. Now, you think I'm being too dramatic here? Well, here's what Melanie Jolie, the new liberal minister of heritage, says she plans to do. She plans to uproot any cultural symbols made in the last nine years. Let me quote. It's very interesting to be in charge of symbols of progressiveness. That was the soul of our platform. The past government didn't have the same vision and values as Canadians, and to that extent, some symbols were changed. And just in case you weren't clear about it, she's going to change the symbols back. For example, that memorial for victims of communism that Stephen Harper had planned, gone. Shame on Harper for delaying it for so long to build it, but since it wasn't built, the Liberals just sacked it. Here's what Jolie said about it. 
commemorative monuments play a key role in reflecting the character, identity, history, and values of Canadians, they should be placed uh, places of reflection, inspiration, and learning, not shrouded in controversy, unquote. Oh, so, so it's controversial to have a memorial for victims of communism. Controversial to whom? Well, that's obvious. It's controversial to people who don't think communist regimes did anything wrong, like her boss. There's a level of, of uh, admiration I actually have for China. Um, because their you know, basic dictatorship is allowing them uh, to actually turn their economy around on a dime. Yeah, he likes that basic dictatorship. So now that memorial will be moved and redesigned and its budget cut. And let's be honest, it's not happening. It's part of that damnatio memoriae. It's part of Harper's memory, so it must be condemned. Now, I'm a Democrat, and I believe that when a party wins an election, it has a mandate to change the country's policies, but this isn't that. This is a destruction and uprooting of the past nine years, explicitly so. Again, an election can give a man mandate for change, but this is such a brazen attempt to raise down the last nine years retroactively. Why? Well, just listen to them. They think the last nine years was false, that it was un-Canadian, maybe even illegal if you press them, certainly unnatural. Even though Harper's Conservatives won three elections in a row, with a greater vote each time, that's illegitimate to the Liberals. Why else would they say Canada is back unless they thought that what happened these past nine years wasn't Canadian? But it's not just how this attitude of damning and condemning the memory of Harper is uprooting things that Canadians supported for nine years. It's the license the Liberals have given themselves going forward to make any and all changes they want to, not just in the interest of Canadians, but more importantly, in the interests of their own Liberal Party. That's what their shocking plans to rush in wholesale electoral changes, more fundamental than anything done in Canada since Confederation. That's what that's all about. Again, winning an election gives you rights to make changes through Parliament, but the Liberals want to condemn the memory of not just Harper, but the entire system that allowed Canadians to do something as awful as voting for Harper three times. So they want to raise down what we call the first past the post system, where you either win or you lose in your riding. They want to replace that with an obscure ranked ballot, transferable ballot, where second choices can win or second and first choices are combined. They haven't quite told us their plan and they don't intend to let us vote on their plan. Isn't that funny? A change to how we vote, and yet we're not allowed to vote on it. Why? What's that about? Well, that's about hubris. That's about blurring the lines between what is Canada and what is the Liberal Party. It's about a psychology of unpersoning, not just Harper, but anyone associated with him, anyone appointed by him, any laws passed by him, any memorials supported by him, any idea shared by him, any person who voted for him. It's about liberal narcissism and vanity and arrogance, but with a new edge to it. If Stephen Harper had this same totalistic approach, he would have stuffed the 22 vacant Senate seats with his friends in the days after the election but before Trudeau was sworn in. If Hor Harper had this approach that the Liberals have, he would have demanded that Liberal appointees who were clearly partisan hacks step down when Harper took over in 2006 like Dominique LeBlanc is now doing with the 33 people like Deepak Chopra. If Harper was like these liberals, in 2006 he would have demanded that Michel Bastarache step down from the Supreme Court of Canada. Bastarache was the chairman of the liberal no committee in the 1995 Quebec referendum. And he was rewarded with a Supreme Court seat, a shockingly political and partisan appointment. If the Tories had played by the same liberal rules, he would have been denounced by Harper and they would have demanded that he resign and maybe they would have sued to get him out and they would have hounded him out of court. They would have made him politically toxic that he couldn't proceed. That's how the liberals were playing. That's not how Harper played, though he was the one called the dictator. I say again, liberals won the election with 39% of the vote in one house of the federal parliament that is constitutionally limited in scope. They don't own the country. They don't own the government. They don't even own the federal government. They are trustees for the majority of seats in the House of Commons. Canada isn't back because Canada never went away. All that's back 
is the smug entitlement party and a prime minister who thinks the world revolves around him and that we owe him everything, including the cost of his own two nannies for his kids. No, Canada isn't back. It never went away. Do you see why it's so important that these authoritarian bullies be limited? That we yank their chain back? That we demand a referendum on their rigged voting scheme? Do you see why we have to take them down a peg and remind them that they're just politicians, not kings or gods? I'm just as much as a Canadian as they are, and so are you. Don't let them hand you a script to read, that you're an unperson, that you're not a full Canadian just because you're a conservative. And hey, if you haven't done so yet, sign our petition to demand that we have a right to vote on their scheme to change elections. Go to letusvote.ca and add your name to other Canadians too. After the break, we'll talk about refugees with refugee expert Giddy Mammon. Stay with us. to know that somewhere in the Prime Minister's office, staffers were pouring through their personal files to try and see whether these families or find out which families would be suitable for a photo op for the Prime Minister's re-election campaign, that's disgusting. Yeah. That's not the Canada we want. That's not the Canada we need to build. A Liberal government would prioritize ethnic and religious minorities. Absolutely not. That's Justin Trudeau before he was Prime Minister in the thick of campaign, of the campaign making it crystal clear that his Liberal government will not favor minorities in the region, Yazidis, Christian Arabs, Kurds, the lambs upon which the Islamic State wolves are feeding. He's crystal clear. He's going to bring over Muslims in any, any proportion, not going to focus on the Yazidis or other minorities. That sounds odd to me. It seems to me that refugees should be the weakest of the lot. Well, joining me now via Skype is Giddy Mammon, for 30 years an immigration lawyer and a bit of a policy expert on these matters to help me sort out what's really going on. Giddy, great to see you. How are you? I'm great. Good to see you, Ezra. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm trying to wrap my head around what's really going on because, of course, we had the Liberal promise that they would bring in 25,000 Syrian refugees by the end of December. Didn't happen. They had a fraction of that many of which were applicants already in the system under the conservative government, private sponsorships. Now they say they're going to bring in 50,000 this year. Who are they bringing in? What, what kind of screening or selection is going on? Who are they choosing and why would the liberals not emphasize the real victims, the people who are the rape slaves or, or at risk of being beheaded? Well, you've asked a lot of questions. So let's first start with the question about uh, the religious backgrounds of the refugees. First of all, typically, if you were to say, you know, we're going to protect Christians, but we're not going to protect Muslims or vice versa, that would sound racist to me. But of course, in the refugee system, the refugee business, what we do every single day is we try to identify people in particular social groups who are particularly at risk. So, for example, if the Christians happen to be the ones who are being persecuted, well, you would go and you would rescue the, 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 the Christians and vice versa. If it was the Muslims or Jews or Yazidis, it doesn't matter. The refugee process is about protecting people and especially the ones that, most, that, that are most at risk. So uh, that's first off. And, I, I, and when I heard Justin Trudeau say that the first time, I was thinking that, that doesn't make any sense. Because right now, of course, there are people who are displaced, Muslims, Christians, all of the people uh, in Syria are suffering from this conflict. But what we are supposed to be doing is picking those people who are at risk. And what I was seeing, uh, particularly on uh, you know, TV and the, in, in, the, in the press, was that the Yazidis were basically and literally running for their lives. So when I heard that the government was about to do something uh, to um, uh, enhance 
uh, our efforts in the region, I thought what they were going to do is pull out a whole bunch of Yazidis and try to offer them protection. So that was the first um, strange thing I saw about this, uh, about this program. Uh, the other thing that I found uh, odd was that um, the government was, it, it sounded, I think, to the general public that what we were going to get involved in is a rescue mission. People who were in Syria who were at risk, who were about to have their, ton their, their towns run over, I thought we were going to go in and rescue those people. But in fact, the government said that they're going to make sure that all of the processing and all of the background checks are done before they bring them in within a certain timeline, which was a ridiculous timeline of December 31st. Uh, and they said, we're going to bring in those people. Well, that immediately excluded anybody who's still in Syria, because we don't have any assets in Syria. We have no way of conducting background checks. We have no way of, 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 of obtaining uh, travel documents and identification documents if they're in a conflict zone. So immediately, um, this was not a rescue operation. What they decided to do instead is because they didn't have time because of their own self-imposed um, time limitations, they said, we're going to go and pull people out who've already reached sanctuary, who've already reached a place of safety, namely Lebanon, Jordan, etc. Well, those people are, are, are now safe. They've managed to get out of the conflict zone, and they're now in a place where they may or may not be comfortable. But what we are doing is really not helping people reach safety. We, we're now helping people who've already reached safety and who now are looking for a better situation. So that's the, that was the two main odd things. Um, but it gets worse. Uh, you know, first of all, before I, 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 uh, I sound um, overly critical of a refugee program, I've dedicated my life to helping refugees. And I give um, uh, Justin Trudeau uh, 10 out of 10 for wanting to help people. So that's terrific. But after that, the execution of this plan uh, is horrible. Uh, you know, he said that he wanted to bring in 25,000 of, of these people who already are, are in the pipe, people who've already been pre-selected, who are already being sponsored by Canadian sponsors. And he announces that he's going to bring in 25,000 by December 31st. What he didn't know, possibly because he didn't ask, is that we only had 8,400 people who meet the criteria that he had. 8,400 people who've been sponsored by Canadian families and Canadian groups to bring them to Canada, and we only had 8,400. So now we're in a situation where in order to keep his uh, election promise, we now have to find 17,000 people who uh, do not meet the criteria that he has set out. So the whole situation is a little bit odd to me, um, but that's, uh, that's where we find ourselves. Hmm. You know, uh, one of the things I've heard is that if we're drawing from the refugee camps in Lebanon, in Jordan, I guess they've abandoned Turkey. That was one of the countries they said originally. What we're doing is we're allowing the United Nations, uh, which is, uh, it, these camps are run by Muslim, of course, uh, United right. Nations staff. We're allowing them to choose from the pools of people they want. I've heard that many of these true minorities, the Yazidis, the Kurds, the Christians, don't want to go to these refugee camps because they're still victimized in those refugee camps, again, by the other Syrian Muslims who are refugees. So even once you're in Jordan or Lebanon or Turkey, there is still violence where the Syrian Muslims rape or are, are physically violent in other ways to Yazidis Christians. So we are actually uh, under-proportioning the true victims that you and I talked about before. Have you heard any concerns about that, that letting a third party, the United Nations, with their own agendas and interests, select from these camps, that that is going to skew this even further? Well, of course. For example, if I, if I had escaped Syria because... Um, uh, one of the problems I was facing is that I'm, uh, you know, I'm gay. Well, I'm not going to go to a refugee camp and announce that I'm gay uh, because there are people in those refugee camps who are going to want to do me harm for the same reasons that they want to do me harm in Syria. So I'm going to be fairly quiet about that. What was, you know, I mean, I can go on about this, but 
one of the problems that we also have with this whole thing is that uh, we in the immigration bar were waiting for the government's criteria. You're going to pick 25,000 people. Well, there's about a million or two million people who are displaced. What's the criteria that we're going to select, that we're going to use to select? Are we going to say that we want people who are already um, privately sponsored, who are already, uh, you know, filed their documentation? Or are we going to say uh, we want the people who are most at risk? Um, or we want people from, uh, you know, this particular camp or this particular place. There was no criteria set. All that we heard from the government is we're going to help 25,000 Syrians. My question was, what, which Syrians should we focus on? And what you're talking about right now uh, is exactly the problem. Uh, there was no assessment of the in inventory. There was no assessment or, or, or uh, explanation of what we are looking for out of the potential pool of million or two million that we're going to select. What, what really happened here is that uh, we were in the middle of a heated election campaign, and I think that what happened is we turned the refugee process uh, basically into a sport. The Conservatives said that they're going to bring in 10,000 as soon as we can with no definite timeline. Uh, they had already landed uh, in 2015 about 1,200 uh, of the 10,000 they promised. And in the middle of the election campaign, someone stands up and says, well, I can, you know, I can beat your 10,000, I'll raise, I'll raise it to 25,000, and I will do it by December 31st. Uh, that's not refugee policy. That's, that's you, know, uh, a, you know, gamesmanship. It's, it's not refugee policy. If we really wanted to help people, we would have sat down, made a few notes, and said, we want to try to help these people because we think that they are in desperate need of help. But these people that we're bringing in are not in desperate need of help. To prove that, the, the um, uh, statistics were just released by, based on information provided by CIC, that out of 10, 10 families that they approached, seven declined the invitation to come to Canada. Well, if you fear for your life, you'll, you'll go to Iceland, you'll go to anywhere yeah. uh, if you fear for your life. But that's not the case because only three out of ten are accepting Canada's offer, and that's because we're fishing in the wrong pond. That's the that's the only reason. Yeah, that's incredible. We're we're asking people to come. We're trying to gin up numbers uh, right. to to meet that political sport, as you mentioned. And yet, he uh, Trudeau, as you heard, vigorously opposes selecting the true lambs from amongst the wolves. Giddy Mammon, what a pleasure to speak with you. I've learned so much from our conversation. I get the feeling this story is going to be in the news for many months yet to come, and I look forward to continuing our conversation. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Ezra. Thank you very much. Stay with us. More straight ahead. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a Fearless Travel Coffee Mug. There's even an Ezra Levant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to therebel.media slash store to find out more. cheering that jubilation how excited the NDP were about ramming bill 6 the farm unionization bill down the throats of farmers the reason this video clip is so powerful to me is it shows what happens when the mask is dropped from the face of the NDP they say they deeply care they want to consult they want to be great governors of the province, but when they're amongst themselves, this was at a, uh, an NDP caucus retreat, a bit of a party, they show their true colors. They despise the Albertans that they govern. They never thought that they would actually govern Albertans. They thought they would be a perpetual protest party. And when they won in an accidental election in Alberta in May, they couldn't believe it, and they're laughing at the farmers who dared speak out. Well, 
Albertans, I think, are getting the measure of the Alberta NDP and are slowly realizing that it's going to be a desperate fight. We've got three and a half years to resist the harshest NDP agenda I think any province has ever seen. And joining me now from Alberta to talk about it is Rick Strankman, the Wild Rose MLA for Drumheller Stetler, who has led the fight for the Wild Rose opposition against Bill 6. Rick, that video of Premier Rachel Notley laughing and laughing and that head back laughter and the cheering jubilation, that's so different than the official tone that they show farmers, oh, we care, we want to do what's right for you. But there was a lust for power in that room and a jubilation that I think is deeply embarrassing to the NDP. It reveals their true colors. It's so frustrating to watch, uh, Ezra. Even one of the, uh, on uh, revisiting that video uh, that you showed there, uh, uh, one of the people uh, to uh, Rachel's uh, stage left uh, wasn't as excited as the rest of the group. Uh, and uh, she was holding her flag or her sign down and uh, was somewhat reticent uh, to what was going on there. Uh, and so, um, it's just something to behold uh, from my activist role that I had uh, as, a, as a farmer, I still believe myself to be a farmer, but to sit in the legislature and view this uh, front on is uh, something that's um, surreal. I've used that word in other interviews. It's uh, openly surreal. Hmm. Well, who, what was your point about the person stage left who, who wasn't so thrilled about it? Who, who are you referring well, to? Well, well, uh, well the uh, brunette girl there with the glasses, uh, she was more reticent, it appeared. Uh, she wasn't as enthusiastic, and uh, it appeared to me that she was almost thrust into a situation that she wasn't quite as comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I'm seeing uh, to, to your verbiage here. Uh, uh, Bill 6 is, uh, and I spoke to it in the last day of session in the legislature, it, it's brought out hundreds of uh, Albertans uh, and indeed uh, thousands to the legislature steps. And uh, my question to the chamber was, why can't we communicate? Why can't Albertans communicate with this government? And to your uh, opening comments about Shannon Phillips wanting to fight, um, those Albertans didn't come to those rallies to fight. They came to express their opinions. Yeah. Well, in, I'm, in many cases, they were they were civilly obedient. They they were there. Certainly, they had raised voices, but there was no one uh, throwing rotten tomatoes other than verbs and, yeah. and verbiages. It's, well, it's you mentioned frustrating. You mentioned Shannon Phillips. Let's talk about a couple of things. We, we've been emphasizing Bill 6, that's the Farm Unionization Act, and, and ranches too. There's also the carbon tax. It's just so many fronts at once, raising the income tax, doubling the, car, the, the carbon tax on big emitters, bringing in a general carbon tax, raising minimum wage for employers who are barely hanging on. And all the time, it, it's a relentless radicalism. And... And here's some year-end interviews. Shannon Phillips said that if there's a backlash, she said, quote, bring it on. And that the carbon tax that she implemented, quote, is just the beginning. And Rachel Notley said similar things too. Both Rachel Notley, the premier, and Shannon Phillips, the environment minister, they say, well, we're Alberta New Democrats. We're used to fighting. Well, hang on, you're used to fighting against other parties, other interests. But who are they fighting against now? They won the election campaign. They're in office. They have a majority. They can pass bills. So when they say they like fighting, they're looking forward to a fight, there's going to be more fights ahead. It sounds to me, Rick, like they're talking about fighting against Albertans. Like, who else are they fighting? The oil patch has largely surrendered to the carbon tax. The, the media in Alberta are generally docile or compliant. So when they say we're looking forward to more fighting, I hear that as we're looking forward to, we took on the oilmen, we took on the farmers, we took on the ranchers, we're going to take on other people next. That, what meaning do you take from that, that they're looking forward to more fights? Well, to me, uh, from that context, uh, Ezra, it, it, it's an open disdain for Albertans. And they don't understand or realize who actually uh, who who they are representing. That is their role as a representative. Uh, again, to the last day of session, uh, uh, Energy Minister Margaret McQuaig Boyd uh, openly very emotional about uh, the response she was getting. Uh, it seemingly from uh, from her constituents and. Uh, 
I, I, I spoke to her after session uh, about that. You have to understand your role. We are representatives. And uh, to bring this forward in an adversarial fashion like you're doing is, um, um, I'm at, at a loss for words, really. Uh, it's like a perfect storm of the low commodity price, the inflection of taxes and more taxes, um, it, it, it's going to be devastating to the province of Alberta, and people are concerned. We've talked about three people so far, the Premier Rachel Notley, Energy Minister Margaret McQuaig Boyd, and Shannon Phillips, the Environment Minister. One thing all three of them have in common is that they're chiefs of staff, that is, their senior uh, mm -hmm. staffer, advisor that implements their will. In all three cases are people from outside Alberta. In the case of the Premier, it's a Toronto Labour organizer named Brian Topp. In the case of Shannon Phillips, it is a former convicted violent criminal from Manitoba named Brent Dancy. In the case of Margaret McQuaig Boyd, it's an anti-oil lobbyist uh, named Graham Mitchell. So all three of these senior cabinet ministers have chiefs of staff who are not Albertan, who don't particularly like Alberta, don't have any ties to Alberta, so they don't think, well, we have to implement this bill in a way that you know, our friends and neighbors will support. Their friends and neighbors are back in Vancouver or Toronto or Winnipeg. That's what's so bizarre to me. It feels to me, Rick, like this is a colonial uh, government of, of people who don't have ties to Alberta, don't have a future in Alberta, commute to Alberta. They haven't moved their families to Alberta. They know they've got three and a half more years to do maximum damage. And then they'll go back to Vancouver or Toronto or whatever and say, yeah, we helped take Alberta down a notch because they have no ties or no roots there. We sure told those guys. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's, uh, it's frustrating, Ezra, and uh, you know, and through all that, um, uh, it's openly frustrating. But I still believe in democracy, and uh, I see a lot of uh, civic pride, uh, patronage, uh, or not patronage, but uh, civic uh, enthusiasm rising up. When you have eighteen hundred people uh, come to the steps of the legislature, it's a it's a. a, a a moment uh, that's very emotional and uh, and I was on the steps there that day and talked to some of those demonstrators uh, that are, are frustrated with the direction this province is taking yeah. and uh, the Wild Rose uh, party is doing their very level best to bring the values of uh, what we believe to be the true values of Albertans forward in the legislature and throughout the constituencies throughout the province. Well, Rick, I appreciate talking with you, and I, uh, we have a lot of viewers in Alberta, but even for those outside Alberta, I think this is an important story because Alberta has been such an economic engine for the rest of the country, such a net contributor uh, financially to the country. Uh, it, it's, it's been, uh, in so many ways, a selfless province. It has transferred billions to the rest of the country, been a magnet for jobs for young people everywhere. and. So it's important to the whole country economically, but it's also an important, a terrible laboratory experiment of what happens when big government ideas like a carbon tax are implemented. I weep for Alberta that it has become a science experiment for the NDP socialist ideas, but hopefully it's a, uh, it's a cautionary tale for other provinces. Unfortunately, I think there's gonna be a lot more bad lessons that we have to be taught before we can get rid of them. Rick Strankman, great to talk to you today. Good luck in 2016, and, and you're our main contact over there for what's going on. I look forward to staying in touch with you in the months ahead. Thanks for having me on, Ezra. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, folks, stick around after the break. Your letters to me. Stay with us. Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Shirelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. Hey, welcome back. My favorite part of the show, your feedback. Todd Ouellette writes about my interview with Tommy Robinson. That was a great interview, Ezra. I've long been a fan of Tommy Robinson. He tells it like it is. The truth is the truth. 
Well, I found him very interesting because he's as deeply thoughtful as any public intellectual I've encountered, especially about the issues of radical Islam. He's clearly well-read on the Koran, and he follows very closely on social media Islamists. But he is from the streets. I mean, you saw him. He's the kind of guy who likes to get into rumbles. He's not afraid of it. He's been punched in the nose more than once. And he is being called every name in the book because he defies what he's supposed to say and do and think. He's actually a true liberal, in the best sense of that word, trying to protect the England he loves from Islamization, not against Muslims. He has more Muslim friends than most liberals, not against Sikhs or blacks or whatever. He's got a lot of friends. He is worried about an anti-British, anti-Western philosophy. His book is called Enemy of the State, and that was the greatest revelation, that the real enemies he faces aren't radical Muslims, but the British government trying to shut him up because he's talking about things they'd rather he not. Next letter, Revelation had some thoughts about my chat with Brian Lilly about media censorship. He wrote, I'd like to see Brian and Ezra confront the heads of these other media organizations and their reporters directly, in person. It may not be the norm, but so what? As to the mainstream media's concern about backlash, I'd suggest that's not the media's concern. In fact, it's really just an excuse to censor. I'd ask them that. Tell me, isn't your concern just a fake reason to censor? Since when is it the job of media to control the public sentiment? Isn't it your job to simply report the facts? How old-fashioned of you. I mean, listen, the Toronto Star, the largest newspaper in Canada by circulation, has a list of left-wing principles called the Atkinson Principles, named after their uh, editor who developed them. They, if you read them, they're incredible. They talk about public ownership of the means of production. Like, it's just crazy Marxist stuff. That is their, it's like welded right into their corporate bylaws of the company. So to say that the Toronto Star, largest newspaper, has a mandate just to call it straight is to misunderstand the Toronto Star. Look at the CBC. They have a mandate to have a, a to... Well, I mean, not just to be political in the statute, the Broadcasting Act, but look, they were just given a $150 million bonus by Justin Trudeau. You know they're going to dance to the tune sung by their master. Dave Winlow responds to my chat with Lori Goldstein about Dalton McGinty. He says, Love the show. What you and Lori Goldstein may have missed is that had McGinty committed to building a Darlington B nuclear station with a capacity of four gigawatts at the beginning of his first mandate, we in Ontario could now still be enjoying six to seven cents per kilowatt hour energy at retail, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, without gas plants as backup, zero emissions, without time of use metering, having eliminated all coal fire plants and guaranteeing hundreds, probably thousands of high tech jobs for the long haul. And the whole thing could have been designed, qualified, built, tested, commissioned, and be up and running in 10 years or less than, for less than half of the $37 billion the energy ministry in this province has frittered away in those same 10 years, according to Ontario's Auditor General. Staggering incompetence, a result of allowing non-technical people to make technical decisions. Well, listen, very interesting, and I appreciate your point about nuclear power, but I disagree with your conclusion. This was not a technical decision. It is not a technical decision to decide to put in wind turbines and solar panels. Gerald Butts, who was the principal secretary to Dalton McGuinty at the time, he's now Justin Trudeau's principal secretary. Gerald Butts, who was the master of the Green Energy Act, he's not stupid. He knew what he was doing. When you argue that nuclear power or gas power is cheaper, Gerald Butts knew that too. High energy prices isn't a bug in the system. It's a feature because Gerald Butts and Dalton McGuinty and Kathleen Wynne and Rachel Notley of Alberta believe that we should reduce our use of energy. That's what the whole Earth Hour is about. That's what reducing your carbon footprint is about. They don't want energy to be cheap. They want it to be painfully expensive so it deters us from using it. They are explicit about this. What do you think Stefan Dion's whole green shift was about? Making energy so expensive it shifts your behavior. That is not a technical decision. It's an ideological one. Hey, folks, it's great to be back in the new year. I thank you for watching us. Send me your feedback on Twitter, on, feed, on, on Facebook, by email. If you haven't signed our petition yet, go to letusvote.ca. What's that about? 
That is about demanding a referendum on these sneaky changes that Justin Trudeau wants to make to our election system. Listen, every party tinkers with election rules. The, the Harper government brought in new rules for ID and new days and da da da. But those are just details that didn't affect more than 1% of people. What Justin Trudeau wants to ram through Parliament is really tantamount to a constitutional change. He wants to have some weird first pass, the, not a first pass vote, some transferable ballot preferential system really designed to give the Liberals a perpetual majority. Yeah, it's time to let us vote.ca. That's it for me. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Keep fighting for freedom.